Hi everybody, welcome to Healthline. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? It is summer. Are you getting your cardiovascular on? Are you swimming? Are you spending time outside with your family and your friends? Are you closing the computer? Are you turning off your iPhone? Are you turning off the TV, your Apple TV, and are you getting some exercise? The most important thing you have is your health, so hopefully you're doing something about it. And I say healthful, and I give you healthful tips all the time. Did you know that here in the United States, we are considered the most obese country in the world? Yet on the other side, everything we do is talk about health and wellness. Why don't we together bring those numbers down, close the computer, go outside, be with your family and your friends, and just make healthier choices. We all think, oh, I didn't know this was happening. Well, we do know this is happening. Um, in the past couple of years, I've lost 30 pounds. It's because I made different choices. It just didn't happen. I decided to do something different. So join me and do something different. Go out and get your health on. Okay, enough about me. Now let's hit the topic of uh, this episode of Healthline. Today we are talking about cardiac arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation. I have no idea what that is. So I decided to go out and get the best of the best from Glendale Adventist Medical Center. Joining me is Dr. Miguel Salazar. His specialty is cardiac electrophysiology. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> How are you, Doc? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, staggering uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. Over 70% of this country is obese. Yes. Yes, indeed. It's, As a doctor, isn't that tragic to you? It's very, very tragic, and it actually has a lot of implications in terms of uh, overall cardiac health, as as you as you know. And which is the conversation of which today. is the conversation? Yes. Quickly, doctor, what is cardiac health? So, uh, cardiac health is just an umbrella term that we like to use. Uh, but it means cardiovascular health. So it means the health of the blood vessels, the health of the heart, and uh, uh, the health of the circulation in your body. So you brought up obesity, for example. So, so let's talk about it briefly. Uh, so people who are obese are more prone to have diabetes, okay? Diabetics are more prone to have problems with the small blood vessels, okay. and those blood vessels tend to get damaged, leading to farther problems and complications. Uh, uh, an extreme example of a complication like that would be an amputation from lack of circulation to the distal extremity, okay. for example. Uh, obesity can also lead to an increase in the blood pressure, leading to hypertension, and hypertension could lead to many different uh, uh, conditions and abnormalities. Hypertension is actually labeled as the silent killer. Oh, I love, so, that. I love that. Okay, <coughs> now, I'm going to end this with a cliffhanger, because then we're going to dive more into this. Who is more obese? I'm going to ask you the question. I'm going to ask you the question. Is it male or females? Who suffers from that more? What do you think? And as I invite you all the time, get up, stretch, get a glass of water, get some fruit, vegetables, do something healthy, even if it's going back and forth with your neck and stretching. Get your body moving. More with Dr. Salazar and the answer to my riddle me this when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to Healthline. So did you get some water? Did you get a carrot stick? Did you kill your cigarette? Did you put your cocktail over there and do something healthy? <coughs> the most important choices you are going to make every day are healthy ones. So I hope in that last break you made one. So the conversation is all about affairs of the heart today. It's all about arrhythmias, cardiac health, and what you do and what you don't, don't do and what you need to know about keeping your ticker healthy. And do you know what an arrhythmia is? Now, before the break, I left you with a riddle me this, a cliffhanger. As you know, I love them. Who is more obese in this country? Over 70% of this country is obese, from children all the way up to men and women. And we have the conversation of health and wellness every year, everywhere, yet it's staggering that, once again, we are the most obese country in the world. It's sad, it's tragic, and we kind of do it to ourselves. Joining us from Glendale Adventist Medical Center is Dr. Miguel Salazar. He is a cardiac electrophysiology specialist. Doctor. Yes. So <clears throat> we left it with who's more obese, men or women? Yes. So the simple answer is actually men are more obese, okay. but women start to catch up right after menopause. Why is that? I think it has a lot to do with hormonal changes okay. and uh, changes in, in, in habits, also from, from the symptoms and signs of uh, menopause. Uh, and why, before we dive into the, the, the topic, why are we so obese? What, what is it? 
Well, diet is for sure the driving force. Uh, and it's actually a very complex question. Uh, I don't claim to, to be able to answer it in, 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 in your segment, sure. but I can give you the short version. Give me the, give, give me so the short, short version, version is that in this country, we're eating too many processed foods okay. and uh, processed sugars, sugars that are really easy to absorb. Okay. okay, in other countries, they eat more grains, they eat sugars that are more complex to break down so the body takes more time, more calories, and absorbs less of that sugar. So that's the simple and the, the answer. And healthier choices. And also, uh, people in other countries, they are a little bit more active in this country, especially in California, <coughs> excuse me, we tend to drive a lot. Uh, we tend to use our cars as the main means of transportation, and we should. I mean, there are certain distances, but let's start parking our cars a little bit farther away from the door to the grocery store. Let's you know? take the stairs. Yeah, let's take the stairs. You know, let's start being a little bit more proactive. Uh, let's go to the park with our families. You were bringing, you know, let's, uh, your, your mission of getting people out there. Let's go to the beach. Let's walk. Okay. Let's leave our phones at home. Let's turn off the computer. Exactly. Let's get up and go out. So you don't necessarily home. have to go and join a gym to, to all of a sudden say, look, I'm exercising, I'm being healthy. No, you just have to increase the level of activity. Because if you do, you're going to start losing weight. If you're diabetic as a consequence of your weight, you may not be diabetic anymore. Which is fantastic. If you have high blood pressure from your weight, all of a sudden your doctor may start cutting back on your medications. So, so, it's, it's, so very it's all in your hands, and it's also paying attention to what your family history is, um, and parents are an example to their children. The co so it's, it's all about heart health and yes. being healthy with your heart. <coughs> Doctor, w what are arrhythmias? So, so I'm going to tie this into the previous discussion, Please. actually, because I think we, we got off on the right foot. Uh, um, so um, um, as I said, high blood pressure is the silent killer. So Please. it can lead to strokes, heart attacks, and arrhythmias. Um, there's an epidemic in this country besides obesity. The epidemic is called an atrial fibrillation epidemic. An atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia. Um, atrial fibrillation means that the top chambers of the heart are not beating regularly. They're actually fibrillating or quivering. Um, there is a structure in the top left chamber called the left atrial appendage. It's just like a little finger that is not doing much really okay. um, uh, in, in our everyday life. But when the heart is not beating, blood tends to accumulate in this appendage-like structure. And if blood is not flowing properly, you can form, or patients can form a clot. If that clot dislodges from that appendage structure, it can travel all the way to the brain and lead to a stroke. Okay. So this is how an arrhythmia can lead to uh, a stroke. Uh, and atrial fibrillation is the main arrhythmia in this country that, that, that causes that. And you said it's, an, it's, it's become an epidemic. It's become an epidemic, yes. Why has it become, what, what are we not doing? Does well, it go back to what we've talked about, about health back and to, exercise It and definitely diet? goes back to uh, uh, obesity and, and diet and exercising. So one of the things that we recently found out, okay, after uh, studying um, the same consequences in, in animals, uh, we found out that people who are more overweight, you know, tend to have uh, more fat tissue on the heart, and that fat tissue tends to be pro-arrhythmic, or it tends to send the heart into arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation. Okay. So one of the main things that I do now with my patients who are uh, in atrial fibrillation or AFib, or who are about to have or have had an ablation with AFib, is I tell them, please lose weight, because that will improve the success of the procedure, the success of the medications, and it will improve their quality of life, their functional ability and capacity, uh, um, and it's just gonna make them live longer. Doctor, since I want to make sure I say this right, since atrial fibrillation is an epidemic, and you say to your patients, lose weight, how are they with that? You know, most of it, it honestly, it takes a procedure, an actual surgery, so they have to get to the surgery uh, for most patients. Okay. There are some patients who are very, very good. You know, they are very disciplined and, and, and they listen to, to the relationship between obesity and that particular arrhythmia. But other patients, uh, uh, they're wonderful patients, but, you know, they really take a hard look at themselves when and after they have had an actual surgical procedure to try to correct the atrial fibrillation.
because that's a very dramatic, you know, uh, 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 way of dealing with something, you know, when you have or you, when you need surgery. So that's Which we'll dive into more of what the surgery <coughs> is. It's amazing that most people become alarmed when you give them bad news. Right. Yes. So are you going to wait till you get bad news to get your health on? I hope not. Don't go away more with Dr. Miguel Salazar and what you need to do to keep your heart healthy when we come back. Welcome back to Healthline. The conversation is all about your heart, arrhythmias and atrial fibrillations. Joining us is Dr. Miguel Salazar. Doctor, real quickly, one more time. Most people become alarmed when they're getting ready to have a procedure about their weight. Yes. <coughs> what can you say to all of us about not becoming alarmed and just getting our health on? Well, I think actually that's the most important thing you can do to avoid a surgery, for example, because they, we're seeing some evidence that by, by just losing weight, people who have a fib, for example, have less episodes of atrial fibrillation and are much better off. They require less medications, and uh, some of them don't end up needing an ablation or surgery for that condition. Which I want to ask you what those are, but it's kind of like scaring them so that they do something different. Right. You know, I remember sitting being heavier. And I went, you know what, I'm tired of this. And I went up and I got up and I went for, it used to be a run, but a hike up my favorite hill. Mm -hmm. I was breathing. It was, I felt horrible. Mm -hmm. Yet the next day I thought, I'm going to do this again. And what is it, um, seven to, f within the first 10 days of doing something, it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly. just creating a healthy habit. Because exactly. you just don't wake up healthy. You just don't wake up obese and unhealthy. Right, right. Uh, doctor, what are the signs and symptoms of arrhythmias, what, what are those? Well, um, you know, arrhythmias, we talked about atrial fibrillation, yes. which is the most common arrhythmia in this country currently, but there, there are, it's an epidemic, there are many other arrhythmias. Arrhythmia is just an umbrella term that we describe to, that we use to describe any abnormalities uh, regarding the electrical system of the heart. Okay. So we don't really think about the heart having an electrical system, but it actually has wires and it, and it has connection between every single little cell in the heart. So when those connections uh, go awry or when the cables of the heart fail, that's when we step in to, to help patients. Okay. So having said that, arrhythmias can have different signs and different symptoms. Okay. So if you were to have an arrhythmia that leads to a slow heart rate, for okay. example, you would feel very dizzy, you may pass out, okay. uh, your pulse will be very, very low. If you have an arrhythmia that leads to palpitations as a sign, you may feel that your pulse is very, very high. That arrhythmia may be due to abnormal interaction between those cells in the upper chambers, or lower chambers too, by the way, or a problem with an extra cable in your heart. Okay. Some patients are born with extra cables and those cables start to act up, usually when they are in their teens, but it's what we call a bimodal distribution, so teens and early 50s or 60s. That's when things start to act up. So doctor, can, can arrhythmias then contribute to heart attacks? Well, heart attacks can cause arrhythmias, especially from the bottom chambers of the heart, okay. called the ventricles. So someone with a completely occluded artery uh, is not getting oxygen to a certain area of the heart. The muscles in that area of the heart can trigger a ventricular tachycardia, okay. which can then deteriorate into ventricular fibrillation. Those arrhythmias can be deadly. Interesting. And the way they are dealt with uh, usually is defibrillating the patient and opening that artery to avoid further episodes. Could I be having an arrhythmia now and not know it? Could, I, um, could there be a little bit of a fluttering, so yes, to speak? Yes, yes, yes. But um, um, because you're not, uh, y y yes, the answer, the simple answer is yes. But just looking at, at you um, um, and uh, knowing your age, uh, knowing the fact that you have lost 30 pounds in the past two years, I would say is very unlikely. Okay. Very, very unlikely. Well, I'm just wondering because maybe, I mean, maybe, it, it, I'm wondering if, if there's always signs or symptoms, you know, if there's always something that you have to look forward to. <laughs> no. Or is it kind of silent? You know, that's col a, that's col a, colon cancer is silent. That's a great question. That is actually a very good question. So I'm going to have to uh, go back to briefly talking about Please. atrial fibrillation, because atrial fibrillation, sometimes people don't have any symptoms. And those patients tend to be a little bit overweight okay. and very sedentary. So they have no symptoms at all. So do you know what the first sign 
of atrial fibrillation is in those patients? Do you know what the first sign of atrial fibrillation is in these patients? No, doctor. A stroke. Wow, so ischemic or hemorrhagic? Uh, embolic. Embo which, embolic. Yeah, which means, remember wow. we briefly went over the clot forming yeah, that absolutely. little area of the heart Well, That clot travels from the left atrial appendage to the left ventricle out through the aorta and the first exit off of that hi highway of blood, as I like to call it, is to the brain. Wow. So you end up with with a stroke from an arrhythmia in the heart. And wow. some people don't feel that arrhythmia. Some people have the stroke and then they are diagnosed with the atrial fibrillation. And is it they don't feel it because they're so large? They are, and, I, and, I, and I hate to use that word. Well, well, you, well, in a way you have to because when you're looking at the actual heart, the top left chamber in these patients tends to be very large. Because when you're when you're obese, your heart is fighting. It's working triple time, isn't it? When you're obese, you're, you're, there, is, there is more demand on more your heart. Work. More work on your heart. There's more work on the lungs. Okay. Uh, the lungs and the heart are actually connected, very, very uh, intimately connected. Uh, and any pressure on the lungs, it's also going to have consequences in the heart. Okay. So, doctor, just say somebody then comes to you and has to have a procedure. What type of procedures are there for this? Well, uh, for so like, our... Like, real quickly, with the, with the stroke, I know that we can do, and we're going to have to hold off on this until we come back. It's a good, it's a good, uh, a good cliffhanger again. There are t quite a few procedures, but can you, people that watch Healthline will see if you know this answer, does TPN work on an embolic stroke? Okay. I love that I know that. Uh, take a deep breath in, deep breath out. That answer when we come back, don't go away. Welcome back. Okay, so I left you on a cliffhanger. There's two types of strokes that we've talked about here on Healthline, the ischemic and the hemorrhagic. And Dr. Miguel Salazar, our guest, said the word abolic. Now, doctor. Mm -hmm. Can an abolic stroke be treated by uh, what is used in other strokes, uh, TPA? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Okay, great. Uh, usually it all depends, uh, as you probably know, from, it sounds to me that you have uh, had previous guests in the past. Yes. Uh, you have to have within, or you have to arrive in the hospital within a window of time, and that hospital, uh, our hospital, will activate the stroke team, and then they, w they will evaluate the, uh, uh, whether you fit the criteria to, to have TPA administered to you. So, it's so, very so was, I, was, it t was it TPA? T TPA. TPA, no, because I said TPN, right? Well, TPN. Oh, TPA. oh <coughs> that's I'm, okay. That's I'm learning okay. here too. Yes, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's a TP, TPA. TPA. Okay, yes, TPA. TPA. And when we've talked about stroke, uh, time loss is brain loss. Exactly. Perfect. You, you said it best. Uh, <laughs> making myself laugh. Doctor, what are some of the medical procedures then in surgeries that somebody that is suffering from AFib that would go through? So uh, uh, the, there are, uh, the main procedure that I do is called an ablation. An ablation is, I mentioned to you that there are some people who are born with extra cables in yeah. their hearts and those cables can trigger arrhythmias. So um, I do a, a, a very, an outpatient surgery to basically remove that cable by cauterizing it. And the arrhythmia usually, depending on where it's located, usually uh, does not come back. So those patients are cured. Uh, there are patients in, in, uh, who have uh, uh, atrial fibrillation who need a, an ablation procedure, and that's a much more complex ablation. You know, sometimes it takes me uh, three and a half hours to complete a procedure like that. Um, uh, Is it just because they are so much more advanced into much AFib? Much more advanced. There are different triggers. Okay. There's not one abnormal cable. <coughs> there are many abnormalities between those cells, you know, in different, different areas. So it just takes more time. To, uh, uh, to, to get rid of the atrial fibrillation with that procedure. Doctor, we were addressing, I didn't even address it at the beginning, what is cardiac electrophysiology? Well, cardiac electrophysiology by now, uh, I, I think I can summarize it. Please. We are cardiologists, essentially, sure. who take care of the electrical system of the heart. Okay. So we are the electricians of the heart, if you want to see us that way. So somebody, thank you for that little backup, so someone has a procedure, what is their recovery time? Well, for most procedures, uh, um, they go home the same day. Okay. 
um, uh, and they're usually up and about the very next day. Will they feel, will there be a heaviness in the heart? Will they feel it? Will they feel fatigued? What, what they, uh, the heaviness in the heart is, uh, can happen, okay. but only in patients who have an atrial fibrillation procedure okay. or a ventricular tachycardia ablation or an epicardial ventricular tachycardia ablation. Uh, but um, mm, I would say 50% of our cases tend to be uh, the cases in which patients have a, an accessory cable, a little cable, an extra cable in their heart, and one simple ablation cures them, so those patients don't tend to have any, any sort of uh, issues post-procedure. Can um, people die from this? People can die from, uh, uh, yes, they can die from atrial fibrillation, but not from the rhythm abnormality, but from the consequences. So can you can you say that again, just so people <coughs> hear? Because a lot of people, again, are surprised. Like, I don't know how I became obese. As you're sitting on your couch, watching four to eight hours of TV every night and not working out. I don't know how I got here. Yes, you do. Can you repeat that one more time? Yes, you can. You can. Uh, the consequences of atrial Thank fibrillation you. can lead <coughs> to to death, for sure. So you already mentioned ischemic strokes, so I'm going to bring it back to that. And, and now you know that there's another category of strokes called, called embolic strokes that are a consequence of atrial fibrillation. Okay. Well, embolic strokes have a 50% greater mortality than ischemic strokes. Okay. They have greater morbidity, so those strokes tend to be larger. People tend to become more disabled when they have strokes secondary or from or as a consequence of the atrial fibrillation. In regards to what we're talking about, how is coffee connected? Coffee is wonderful. We should all drink it. Oh. Well, uh, that's the short answer. Okay. That's the short answer. I'm a coffee drinker myself. But coffee can lead to palpitations. Okay. Uh, palpitations is when you become aware of your heart, heart rate or rhythm. You feel it beating in your you chest. You feel it beating in your chest. Most of the time, uh, um, uh, that is is nothing. It's just um, um, you Too much are coffee. you becoming yeah drinking coffee. What is it saying? You're amped and becoming aware of your heartbeat okay. and your heart rate. Um, now, coffee. Uh, if you're taking caffeine pill, pills, for example, one caffeine p pill I think it equals five cups of coffee. If okay. you're taking a couple of those, I know college students sometimes do that. That can trigger an arrhythmia if you have. Uh, if you're prone to it, or if you have an, e an extra cable, for example, or something that can can throw you over the edge, you know. So the caffeine, excess caffeine or excess alcohol, excess anything can push you over the edge. Uh, same thing with uh, like Red Bulls and stuff like that. Yes, so. exactly. Uh, what about, uh, is it hereditary? There are some arrhythmias that are hereditary. Okay. Uh, they are uh, more rare. Okay. Um, atrial fibrillation, most cases of atrial fibrillation are not. Okay. Um, uh, most case, most uh, um, cases of atrial fibrillation are related to risk factors. So if okay. you have diabetes, if you're obese, if you have high blood pressure. Uh, and the factor that you can't really control is age. Okay. So people, as we get older, we're more prone to have arrhythmias. We're more prone to atrial fibrillation. Uh, but uh, that's the only thing I think we can control, uh, the age. But we can control high, high blood pressure, we can control obesity, we can control obstructive sleep apnea, which we didn't really talk about, but, but can be a consequence of obesity. Okay. Um, <coughs> and just becoming more active, you know, going back to our initial conversation. Just being healthy. Health. Exactly. Just being healthy. It sounds cliche, but I'm telling you, you know, my patients come to me, and they ask me, what can I get at Costco? What can I get at the store? What vitamins should I get? What, what? And, and these, these vitamins are very expensive. I tell them, you know what? Just walk 30 minutes a day. You know, it's free. You know, <laughs> make two, 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 uh, two laps around your neighborhood. That's free. That's completely free. That's going to be better than your multivitamin, than your vitamin E. Get your health on. Thank you, doctor. Okay, so you heard it from Dr. Salazar. It's not about the vitamins or the pills or all this extra stuff, yet if your doctor wants you to take it, absolutely. All you gotta do is get up, go outside, at least walk two blocks every day to start your heart moving, getting your health on. Remember, the most important conversation you're gonna have is about your health, and we just had a great one. Be the captain of your ship and do something healthy today, and please, I invite you to join us on social media. Find us on our Twitter account at GAMC Health and find us on Facebook. Remember again, 
It's all about you and your health. So make it a healthy day. We'll see you next time.